okay, you win. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do an analysis of Sun Yang's stroke. I had that many comments on the last video that people wanted to have a look at his technique and break it down. So we're going to do that in today's video. Now we looked at Gregorio Pelcineri's stroke last week because he broke the 1500. No, he got the second fastest time in the 1500 ever. So we broke down his technique and saw how unusual it was compared to the traditional sort of perfect freestyle technique that we've looked at in the past. Now Sun Yang is probably as close as you can get to a textbook freestyle. It is a really, really nice stroke and he has a very, very long stroke. Now, if you compare Gregorio Palcineri to Sun Yang, 27 strokes per lap for Sun Yang compared to 40 strokes per lap for Gregorio Palcineri. Now that is a massive difference. That is almost 50% more strokes per lap yet they're you know, pretty close to the same time. So it just goes to show there are certainly some differences that are okay to have when it comes to freestyle technique. Now in this video, I wanna show you some things that you may not have noticed before in his 2012 London Olympic swim, where he broke the world record. There's some things he does throughout the race that are, go against the grain to what you would probably think should be done when you are the world record holder. So I wanna point those out and we're gonna break down his technique and look at what he does well and how you might be able to incorporate some of those things into your own stroke. Even if you're not six foot seven tall, you can still take away some of this stuff. And there's some things here that I think most swimmers can use in their swimming because while we want you to find your own technique, your own style, he has, I guess you'd almost call it the perfect stroke. And so you'll be able to emulate some of these things and try and copy them in your own stroke. So let's have a look at uh, first thing which we'll see is his head position which is one of the first things we often like to, to look at. Now, if we look at head position here, you'll see that for the most part, for, uh, for the most part, he looks slightly forwards most of the time. Now he's not looking straight down, he's looking slightly forwards there. All right, and as you know, zero to 45 degrees, anywhere in this sort of range is where we wanna be. And he looks slightly forwards there. And at times a little bit further throughout the race, he looks a little bit further down. So as you can see through here, all right, so that head position is just a little bit further down, but still just looking slightly slightly ahead there. And if we have a look at the depth of his head, you'll notice that he's just got the crown of his head out of the water. So as we come in a little bit closer, you'll see that his head is just sticking out of the water. But because he's got such a smooth stroke and such a balanced stroke that you get this, like this bow wave sort of just sort of comes over the top of his head. You get the uh, the water coming just over the top of his head. So he's got the, the top of his head just above the water, but it's still covered by the water because his stroke is so smooth. And then you can see, obviously he comes up a little bit to get the breath there. So that is really, really nice. Now, compared to Gregorio, look, Gregorio's ha uh, head position is a little bit higher than that because he tends to sit that little bit higher in the water and he's got this loping sort of freestyle instead of this more balanced and even stroke. Now, if we have a look under the water at his body position, you'll see that we get the hips up near the surface, the heels break the surface every kick that he does there. So we get this great, obviously really good body position where he's parallel with the surface of the water. So very little extra drag created there from the body position. So it doesn't get much better than that position. Now, one of the things that, um, that I think is important to look at is the recovery. So the recovery is when you're above the water. Now, if we look at this here, you'll see he exits just past the hip. And when we're explaining this, sometimes people think that they either need to push back as far as they can, but if your arm is straight, so your arm is fully extended at the back, you're probably going to get a little bit stuck and it's probably a little bit too far to push back. So you wanna have this little bit of a bend in the elbow when your hand exits the water. So if you exit just past your hip, then that's usually the right distance to, to press back to. Now over the top here, you'll see that it's what we call an elbow led recovery, as in the elbow leads the way until about here, then the hand swings in front. So usually that's what we wanna try and get is a more elbow led recovery over the top so that the hand doesn't pass the elbow until about, at least about here, but you can see that he continues to go until he gets to about halfway there. Now the reason that we want a little bit more of an, an elbow led recovery as opposed to a hand led recovery is it helps you be a lot more open through your recovery, through your shoulders. So it just means that you can, you're sort of showing your underarm to that side of the wall. And when I'm coaching clinics, I'll be on deck and I'll say, 
you know, as your arm comes over the top, as a coach, I should be able to see your underarm or your armpit if you're recovering well enough, because it just means that you're getting that shoulder out of the water enough to get a nice and open and clear and easy recovery over the top of the water. So you can see that position there. And you can see the hand swings in front about here. So that is the, uh, the first thing that we can see. And then one of the things that I try and focus on a lot, and often when people join our membership and I'm working with them and going through their video analysis, is that often people won't be entering in the right position. And if you don't enter in the right position, it can really impact your, your catch. So one thing that we wanna try and get here is fingertips first, elbow up entry. So your arm should make this triangle shape upon entry as you, as you go in there. Now, the reason behind that is then it will leave you with a little bit of room to slide the hand forwards, get rid of the bubbles on the hand, and it makes it a lot easier to set up the catch. So you can see it there on the right side. Now, if we look at that from under the water, which we will see right here. All right, so here we go. You'll notice that uh, with that finger's first entry, you can then slide the hand forwards and the bubbles just leave the hand there as he extends forwards. And then he's able to get into the catch and just give himself that little bit of extra time uh, before he goes into it. Because sometimes we find that people just pull straight through straight away and there's no reach or extension phase. So what I mean by reach or extension phase is hand enters, reaches forwards like you're reaching for that wall in front of you and then go into the catch. That gets through the bubbles. That gives you a little bit more distance with each stroke and that it feels like it's a lot easier to swim that way. So if you do enter the water and you just pull immediately through and there's no reach and extension, then you're probably missing out on a little bit of distance per stroke. Now, uh, you can see here on some of the strokes, what happens with Sun Yang is that the fingertips sometimes come up. Now, we wanna try and avoid that, but he does it only occasionally. All right, so the fingers enter there, all right, reaching forwards. Fingertips are just above the wrist, as you can see but pretty quickly he gets down to the starting catch position. So this is what we refer to as the starting catch position, which is fingers below wrist, wrist below elbow, with the fingertips at underarm depth. So you can just see that position through there. Now that is the most efficient position you'll probably be in, in your stroke, is when your fingertips are at underarm depth and that hand is, has just pressed back past the, past the hip there. So if you can get into that starting catch position, that means you're going to be very streamlined through the water and very efficient. Often we find people either have their fingers up too high, so it's slowing them down, it increases the drag, or often people will come in too deep. So it's pretty common for me to be working with someone in our membership and they'll send in a video. And one of the things that they do is they'll enter and where they finish reaching forwards is down here. Let's say it's 20 or 30 centimeters below the underarm. It's too deep. You're going to be copping a lot of extra drag on top of the arm. Now, yeah, some swimmers, like if you look at Janet Evans, who we did, um, who we re reviewed, she would sort of enter and start that catch really quickly. There's very little extension phase of the stroke, but that's more the exception than the, than the norm. So we want that little bit of reach there. So get to that position. Now from here, Sun Yang has got an amazing high elbow catch as good as it probably, you know, as good as it really gets. And being a 1500 meter swimmer, or primarily being a 1500 meter swimmer, doing 27 strokes per lap, which is as low as you pretty much get. The only other swimmer really that sort of gets down to that is that I see is Mac Horton. Now with that sort of um, time spent or that time to get a good catch, he can get a really pronounced high elbow catch, particularly on this side here. So if you have a look at that catch from this position to this position, it's almost like the upper arm does not move, all right? That does not move while the hand and forearm tip down. And now he's got this nice big paddle to work with. So if you think of what a high elbow catch is, the way we determine it is when you finish the catch, so that's the start, that's the finish, draw a line from the shoulder to the elbow. If that elbow is above that straight line, when you finish the catch, we consider it a high elbow catch. So he's well, well above it. Now this is almost 90 degrees. Now. Most adults that I work with, most triathletes that I work with do not have that sort of range in their shoulders. It is just not comfortable, it is not sustainable. So you don't need to go for that, but we wanna work in that direction a little bit. That's what we wanna to start to work towards a little bit, but not 90 degrees, it's too much for most people. But it is good to see what the very best in the world can do. 
and uh, and just see you know, what that what that looks like. As you can see there, it's pretty much a 90 degree angle, which is extreme. That is out of this world. Now you can see what a big paddle he's then got to work with as he presses back. So the hand and forearm pretty much stay vertical with the with the surface of the water the entire way through the stroke there, which is really impressive. And that is a huge factor in him getting such a, well, taking so fewer strokes for the um, for the each lap. Now, obviously, yeah, being six foot seven helps as well, but um, that really impressive catch is a big factor in that. So I'm just gonna play that through. Now, the other thing that you uh, will notice here is his kick. I'm just gonna bring it back. So in, in regards to his kick, through the majority of his 1500, he was doing a four beat kick. And then in the last hundred, he picks it up to a six beat kick. So with his four beat kick, you can basically see on his breathing stroke here. All right, so we get, so breathing stroke, we get the left foot doing a small kick down there. And then we get on the other stroke, you get one, two, three and then breathing, and then we get that one. And then that kick there. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a six beat kick with a, it's got this small little sort of flutter here. So you can kind of count it as a kick. If you do count that as a kick, then it's kind of like a six beat kick, but really it, it's more like a, a four beat kick. So we get this downwards kick. So one, two, three, four. Oh, and then we miss it there. But um, it's kind of like a four beat kick. now. If you're thinking about doing a four beat kick, it's usually one kick on one side and then one, two, three. One kick and then one, two, three. And I find it is such a, an efficient way to, to swim. And I've found that a lot of the people that I coach, when they finally get that timing of a four beat kick, they find that it's, it's really easy to sustain very close to their maximum sort of distance speed, their threshold speed for a long time, so much easier than a, a six beat kick. Now, obviously everyone's different, but I, I love a four beat kick. And I, I think if you um, are not too sure whether it's for you, it can be worth just sort of practicing that and seeing if you, if you can get a, a four beat kick. Now, if we look at the catch from the front, we do get this good angle here. Yeah, now looking from the front. So there's that starting catch position. We've got fingers below wrist, wrist below elbow. All right, now as he goes down here, you'll see the fingertips tip down. Now there's a slight out sweep, which means that the hand moves away from the center just a little bit, which is what we want. So hand moves away from the center slightly and you can see this really nice angle. All right, so as he finishes the catch there, what we like to look at is the angle of the arm. You'll see he's at 108 degrees through the elbow. We want that to be 100 to 120. So he's nicely within that range there and that allows him to get his hand and forearm mostly vertical it allows him to be using his lats and those stronger muscles through the back and the shoulder there. And that is just a great position. We refer to that as the power diamond position. So if you have a look at that, it's half a diamond. So if you had both arms in that position, it'd be a diamond shape. So think of that as the power diamond. That is where we want to get to. And then we get this in sweep when the hand comes in a bit closer to the center and then just finishing off just past the hip there. So that, um, that is pretty much as good as it gets. So really, really good. And again, as you can see, there's that catch. So yeah, most people can't do that. Their shoulders just do not hold that sort of range, especially under any sort of load. Um, but that's, that's exactly what a high elbow catch uh, is right there. Now, the other thing that um, you might find interesting is his breathing in this 1500. For the majority of it, for most of it, he actually breathes every single stroke uh, for three strokes off the wall. And then he goes into a uh, breathing every two pattern. So let me show you this here. All right, so. All right, so if you look at this here, he breathes the first stroke off the wall. So he's breathing to the right. And I'm gonna zoom in for you so you can see it properly. All right, so he breathes to the right, breathes to the left, breathes again to the right. Okay, and then he goes into breathing every two strokes to his right hand side. And then once he gets a bit further down the pool, which, uh, which I might be able to show you here. Yep, so then when he gets a bit further down the pool, all right, so he's breathed to the right, then he breathes again to the left. So immediately after we get a right breath, left breath, 
right breath and then he takes another stroke and then he goes right, left and then takes that final stroke. So on a few occasions with each lap that he takes, he's actually breathing every single stroke. So the first three off the wall, then he goes into breathing every two strokes and then he breathes three strokes in a row and then he goes the second one and then immediately after. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this if, you tr- if you're swimming open water, but this is a strategy for open for long distance swimmers who are swimming in the pool because they're going into the turn. And so with that turn, you basically have a, a period of time where you're not getting a, a breath or you, know, you, you kind of get the air taken out of you a little bit off the turn. And so what he's, he's basically doing there is just making sure that he keeps his oxygen levels up um, and he gets enough air in to be able to kind of get through the, the turn and maintain his, his energy. So I wouldn't recommend this doing open water. You ideally shouldn't be breathing every, every stroke there, um, but you can see that this is a valid strategy for 800, 1500 meter swimmers. Obviously not everyone does it, but you do see this with some of those distance swimmers, particularly going into the wall. So it might be you know, breathing one, two, and then do the turn. Um, and obviously, as you can see, sometimes coming off the turn. Now, it's not something that I would necessarily try and train. If I was coaching junior athletes, I wouldn't make them do that. I'd try and get them to sort of breathe every two or whatever it is, just get them to sort of not breathe every single stroke. But it is interesting to, to see this here. So if you are racing 800s or 1500s, maybe try it in training and see how you see how you go. Now, this is when he picks up his kick. This is when he has that six beat kick at the end. So you can see we get one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we start again. So that's the six beat kick where he picks it up for that last hundred um, just to, to finish off the, the 1500. So uh, the other angle that I wanted to show you was the above water shot here, which we get a nice little close up of in a second. All right, here we go. So from above, one of the things that we like to to think about is we call it swimming on train tracks. So if you imagine that you've got these train tracks in line with your ears, every time your hand enters, we should follow those train tracks just when you enter and reach forwards. So you'll see that his left hand enters in line with his left shoulder and extends straight forwards. Have a look at what, what a great line he's got through his body there. So very narrow through his entire body. We talk about it as you could swim through a 30 centimeter corridor all right, that your body would stay within it. So such a great long streamlined position there. And then the right arm, similar thing, all right, in line with his shoulder, all right, really nice alignment. So that is excellent. Now, in terms of his timing, you'll notice that he's front quadrant. So front quadrant means if we split the body into four quarters, all right, we've got one, two, three, four. We always want to have something in that front quadrant there. All right, so you can see that there's always a hand or an arm in front of him through there. Now, again, if you remember um, the video that we did of Gregorio Palcineri, he's he's just off being front quadrant on some of his strokes. So it goes so you don't need to be front quadrant, but I've found that 95% of swimmers that I work with are better off with a front quadrant stroke. Um, most, yeah, most people are better with a front quadrant stroke. So just always having something in that front quadrant at, at all times. It, it really does help. Now with the recovery here, all right, so we've got uh, the recovery. If you've thought about thinking, if you've thought about having a high elbow recovery, all right, so you're trying to bring the arm over really high and the hand close to your body. For most people, especially adults, they don't have the range through their shoulders to come super close to their body. So if you are aiming for a high elbow recovery, you could get jammed up through your shoulders. So even with Sun Yang, who is you know, pretty much as good as it gets when it comes to distance for me. You can see that with that angle of his arm, he's not really close to his body with his hand. He's still somewhat open. So the angle there is about 90 degrees as he comes through. And this one here, similar thing, you know, maybe 85 degrees or so, roughly 90 degrees with that arm. So if you're trying to come really close with your hand to your body, it's going to restrict your movement. So I like to, I encourage most people to be here, sometimes a little bit wider. You saw that Gregorio was somewhere out here with one arm and about there with another. So there's no point trying to come super close to the body. Um, if you look at some as like Michael Phelps, he came comes pretty close to the body. Um, Mac Horton comes fairly close to the body, but those guys are really mobile. 
really mobile and uh, most adults aren't. So that's why we encourage people to just go that little bit wider with the recovery. The other thing you'll notice here, and I find this is great for your timing, is the timing of your catch and kick. And we've covered this in a video before, which I'll link to above, is ideally we wanna have the catch going at the same time as that downwards kick on that side. So left arm catch, left foot kicking down. Now that sort of sends this energy through the body and you sort of can then pull against it. So this downwards kick here transfers that sort of energy through the body and it feels like you've then got something to pull against. So it sort of stabilizes the hips. And now that with a slightly more stable hip, he can use this, this catch to sort of pull himself against something. That's where you kind of get that cross connection through the, the body and you can feel like you can almost anchor yourself in the water and pull yourself past that, that anchor point. It comes from the downwards kick and catch happening together, especially with a four beat kick. Um, most people, most people find that easier to do with a, with a four beat kick. Mm -hmm.